Welcome to the last unit of differential equations. Woo! Uh, this last unit is a little bit Frankenstein in that we have a few different topics kind of smooshed together. This first video, 11.1, .1, is going to form a little bit of background that will guide what we do moving forward. So this section covers orthogonal functions. We're going to start with a little bit of review. First thing I want to review is the inner or dot product. So if you remember, if we have two vectors and we dot them, u dot v, another way to write that is if we write in parentheses, that means the dot product. And if you remember, what you're going to do when you find the dot product is you're going to multiply the corresponding components and then sum them up. So the dot product gives us a constant. A few different properties. If we have u dot v, that's the same as v dotted with u. If we have some constant k multiplied by our vector u, we can bring that out and find the dot product first and then multiply by k. If we have a vector and we dot it with itself and we get zero, that's only going to happen if that vector u is zero, is the zero vector rather. Otherwise, that dot product is going to be greater than zero otherwise. Again, though, that's only when we're dotting a vector with itself. And then lastly, if we have u add v and we're dotting that with w, we can also calculate that as u dotted with w add v dotted with w. So we are now going to generalize this inner or this dot product. So the inner product of two functions, f1 and f2 on some interval a to b, we can write it as f1 comma f2. And the way to calculate that is it's going to be the integral from a to b of f1 of x multiplied by f2 of x dx. Okay, and then a quick note is a definite integral has the same properties. as those listed above. Okay, so then we say that two functions are orthogonal on that interval a to b if the inner product, so that f1 comma f2, again, which is the definite integral from a to b of f1 of x multiplied by f2 of x dx, if that inner product is equal to zero. Now, one thing that I need us to know is when we say functions are orthogonal, we do not mean perpendicular. We do not mean perpendicular. There is no geometric significance to two functions being orthogonal. So let's take a look at our first example, example number one. We are looking at these functions f1 of x and f2 of x on some interval, our interval being from negative one to one. So if we want to find the inner product of f1 and f2, we're going to do the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x squared multiplied by x cubed dx. So this will be the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x to the fifth dx, which is 1 sixth x to the sixth, being evaluated from negative 1 to 1. So we end up with an inner product of 0, which tells us that f1 of x and f2 of x are orthogonal. on the interval negative one to one. So what that leads us to is this definition. A set of functions, such as these, is orthogonal on A to B if the inner product, which is, again, our integral from A to B, is equal to zero for m not equal to n. So a set of functions is orthogonal if you choose any pair of them and the inner product gives you zero. So that needs to be true for every single pair. So then an orthogonal set of functions is said to be orthonormal if the magnitude of the function is one for each of those functions. 
So again, that set is called orthonormal if the magnitude of every single function is one. So then a little bit of a quick review, if we do the inner product of a function with itself, that's the same as the magnitude of that vector squared. So where that leads us to then is the magnitude of u is the same as the square root of the inner product of u with itself. So where that leads us to then is that this magnitude up here, so the magnitude of phi n of x is the same as the square root of the inner product of phi n or phi n, be pronounced either way, with itself. Okay, so now that we have all of this background, we're going to look at a few more complicated examples. Example number two, show that the set of functions 1, cosine x, cosine 2x, so on and so forth, is orthogonal on the interval negative pi to pi. So thinking about what it means to be orthogonal, we're going to need to show that the inner product of a function phi m and phi n is 0 for any two functions where m is not so we need to show that the inner product of any two functions where it's not the same function is going to give us zero. So taking a look at what our functions are, our first function is just plain old one. And then every function after that can be written as cosine of nx. So there's actually two cases that we need to show. Case one is we need to show that the inner product of the initial function phi zero and some other function is 0, and that's when n is not 0. Alternately, we need to show that phi m of x and phi n of x, the inner product of those two functions, is also 0, where m is not equal to n. So again, what I'm writing here is if I'm looking at the inner product there are basically two different possibilities. I could choose one and one of the cosines, or I could choose two of the cosines together. So this first case is one and one of the cosines. The second case is two of the cosines together. So let's look at this first case. We're doing the inner product of phi zero of x and phi n of x. So this is gonna be the inner integral from negative pi to pi of one multiplied by cosine of n x dx. So if I integrate, this gives me 1 over n sine of nx being evaluated from negative pi to pi, which just gives us 0. Okay, on the other hand, if I now am taking the inner product of phi m and phi n of x, this is going to be the integral from negative pi to pi of cosine of mx multiplied by cosine of nx dx. Now this is going to be a little bit of... Um, pre-calc or uh, trig throwback, but what do we do when we have a product of cosines? Well, hopefully we remember this becomes one half, and I can write this as a sum of cosines. So this is cosine of m add n x, add cosine of m subtract n x dx. So now I can finally integrate. So I have that one half and I end up with sine of m add n multiplied by x over m add n, add sine of m subtract n times x over m subtract n. All of that being evaluated from negative pi to positive pi, which also gives us zero. So hence we have shown that this set is orthogonal because no matter what two functions we choose, the inner product of those two functions is going to be zero. Okay, so now we're going to continue this in example number three. We're going to use that orthogonal set from above to form an orthonormal set. Orthonormal set, remember, means that the magnitude of each of those functions is one. So if we look at, first of all, the magnitude of the first function, phi zero of x, that's the square root of the inner product of the function with itself, so this is integrating 1, we just get x from negative pi to pi. So the magnitude of that is the square root of 2 pi. Then if I look at the magnitude of any of the functions in terms of cosine, that's going to be the square root 
of the integral from negative pi to pi of cosine squared of nx dx. This is going to be another trig substitution that you may or may not remember. So this is the integral of negative pi to pi of 1 half multiplied by the quantity 1 add cosine of 2nx dx. So then when I integrate in parentheses, I'm going to get x add sine of 2nx over 2n, all of that being evaluated from negative pi to pi. So this ends up being the square root of 1 half times pi subtract negative pi, which finally is the square root of pi. So now our answer, if we want the orthonormal set, I have to make each function have a magnitude of 1. So I'll have 1 over the square root of 2 pi. And then I have cosine of x over the square root of pi and cosine of 2x over the square root of pi, so on and so forth. So that will be orthonormal on negative pi to pi. Okay, so the question that you are probably asking yourself is where is this leading? When are we going to use it? So our goal in later videos is we want to be able to expand a function in terms of an infinite set of orthogonal functions. So let's get a little bit of a preview of that. Let's say that we have some function f of x, and this is how we want to express it. So we're going to have some constant times a function, another constant times a function, and that phi n of x is an infinite orthogonal set of functions on some interval a to b. We want to find those constants c0, c1, so on and so forth, using the inner product. So if we take the inner product from a to b of f of x with any of those functions phi m of x, that will give us c0 times the integral from a to b of phi 0 of x, phi m of x dx, plus so on and so forth. Okay, on this right-hand side of the equation, all of those integrals are going to equal 0 because our functions are orthogonal, except in the case where m is equal to n, when we have the same function twice. So what that gives us then is that the integral from a to b of f of x of phi n of x dx, I just instead of m decided to use n, so that is going to be cn, and then the integral a to b of phi n squared of x dx. So this is just the inner product of some function with itself. So where this leads us to then is that c of n, so that's what we're trying to solve for, our constant. And the numerator is going to be the integral from a to b of f of x times phi n of x dx. And in the denominator, we're going to have the integral from a to b of the inner product of that function with itself for n is equal to 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth. Okay, so now that we've derived that a little bit, on the right, I'm going to write that a little bit more formally. So expressed differently, we're going to write f of x as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of c of n phi n of x, where our cn is equal to that, or this can be written as f of x is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. The numerator is the inner product of f with phi of n. The denominator is the magnitude of phi n of x squared times phi n of x. So this is just that c of n. So again, this is just a preview of where we're headed with these orthogonal functions. So this leads us to our next definition. A set of real valued functions, phi 0, phi 1, etc., 
is orthogonal with respect to a weight function, w of x, on the interval a to b if the integral from a, b of wx times phi n of x multiplied by phi n of x dx is equal to 0 for m is not equal to n. We will assume that that weight function has a value greater than 0 on that interval a to b. If the set is orthogonal, then, with respect to that weight function w of x, then c of n is going to become, in the numerator, we'll have the inter integral from a to b of f of x times w of x times phi n of x dx. In the denominator, we're going to have the magnitude of phi n of x squared. And in that denominator, remember, that is, it looks like magnitude, but really that is the inner product of the function with itself, which in this case includes the w of x. So then this note here, either series expansion, so either c of n, the one that we have on this page that has the weight function, or the one on the previous page that did not include the weight function, both of those expansions are said to be an orthogonal expansion of f, or what we call a generalized Fourier series. This Fourier series is what the next few videos after this one are going to focus on, is how we find a Fourier series, what is a Fourier series. So we have one last definition and another example to complete the video. So last definition, the set phi of n's is said to be complete in the class S if those phi n of x, so if all of those functions, if that set contains sufficiently many functions so that every function in S this class S, can be written in the form f of x is equal to sum sum from n equals 0 to infinity of cn phi n of x. So in simpler terms, we're saying that a set of functions is complete in some class if every function in that class can be written as a series expansion of those phi of n's. For a set to be complete, the only function that is orthogonal to each member of the set has to be the zero function. So let's take a look at our last example. If S is the set of vectors in three space, then if we use v1, v2, and v3, they form a complete set in three space. And that's because, of course, any vector in three space can be written as a linear combination of these three. So that is the end of this video. Like I said, this was a lot of background covering inner product and orthogonal sets and orthonormal sets to lead us to this idea, like we said above, of a FOIA series. The next few videos, we'll be finding these FOIA series. Until next time, thank you for watching.